Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. Welcome. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, we are here today for the Administrator's Overview of Professional Learning Community Emergent Literacy, Module 3 Vocabulary. I'm Carly Willis with the Regional Educational Laboratory Southeast at Florida State University. And our REL Southeast team here with us today is Dr. Beth Phillips, Dr. Marcia Kasanovich, and Ms. Sarah Hughes. We are so glad for, that you have joined us today, and we are looking forward to spending a little bit of time with you. We invite you to use the chat throughout our time together today. We will be monitoring that and trying to answer questions as they come in. If we miss any though, we will follow up after the webinar via email. We ask that you mute yourself um, when we are talking as a whole group so we can limit background noise. And we plan to present some information whole group and then we'll go to our breakout rooms so that we can all participate in a discussion in a bit. We are recording today's webinar for those who wanted to be here but couldn't attend. And for those who are here and want to review or share the information later on. All the materials from today will be available on our PLC website. If you are not familiar with the RHEL program, the regional educational laboratories are supported by the Institute of Education Sciences at the U.S. Department of Education. And the RELs conduct applied research and trainings with a mission of supporting a more evidence-based education system. There are 10 RELs across the country, as you can see, and our REL is the REL Southeast at Florida State University. And we support North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Florida. This is the REL disclaimer slide stating that we're not mandating that you use the information we share with you. And where have we been? Well, we are conducting a series of four webinars for administrators. The overarching goals of the webinars are to increase understanding and use evidence-based emergent literacy instruction in preschool settings and acquaint administrators with the professional learning community emergent literacy materials. So we'd like to take a moment to remind ourselves of where we've been and the first thing that we did was we conducted webinar one in December of 2020. And during that webinar, we shared the benefits of preschool teachers engaging in a PLC, particularly focused on emergent literacy. And we introduced to you the PLC emergent literacy materials developed by REL Southeast with a particular focus at that webinar on print knowledge. Then in April of this year, we conducted webinar two, which focused on phonological awareness, which is module two from the PLC Emergent Literacy Materials. At that webinar, we shared ideas about implementing a PLC. We took a closer look at the content from module two and discussed how the content related to your context. So where will we go today? Today is webinar three, and the focus is on module three vocabulary from the PLC materials. We'll also be sharing ideas about implementing PLCs using these materials. As an overview of our meeting today, we will be providing a brief reminder of the research and benefits of a PLC focused on emergent literacy. We're going to conduct a quick overview of the materials once again. We'll take a closer look at module three vocabulary from those materials, and we'll discuss how the topics presented today relate to your context. Our intention is that after today's webinar, you'll have the motivation and tools to create a team at your site to discuss implementation of the PLC or just go ahead and get started with it. So now I'll turn the time over to Marcia. Thank you, Carly. Good morning, everyone. I'm Marcia Kasanovich, and I'm going to share a brief overview of the research and benefits of implementing a professional learning community focus on emergent literacy. So the REL Southeast collaborated with the School Readiness Partnership to develop the PLC Emergent Literacy, which was released in December. We refer to it as a PLC for short. 
So the PLC materials are grounded in three areas of research and evidence. First, the four areas of emergent literacy children need to be more likely to understand what they read when formal reading instruction begins. Second, the structure of a PLC of a professional learning community, which provides collabor collaborative and engaging learning experiences for teachers. And third, instructional practices that are evidence based. So I'll briefly highlight these areas of research. The first area of research tells us that pre-kindergarten language skills are associated with better reading comprehension later in school. Findings show that the foundation for reading comprehension is established in the pre-kindergarten years through the development of language comprehension, like vocabulary and grammar, and code-related skills, for example, phonological awareness and letter knowledge. So the PLC materials are organized by four modules, and each module focuses on one of the four foundational emergent literacy components, print knowledge, phonological awareness, vocabulary, and oral language. So let's see how these four emergent literacy components relate to reading comprehension. This animation is called the literacy tree and it's part of the PLC materials. Um, it's found in module two, so it's focused mo mostly on phonological awareness, but it also shows how the other emergent literacy components included in the PLC relate to later reading comprehension. So as you watch the video, pay particular attention to the connections that oral language has throughout the literacy tree. Phonological awareness, which is taught in pre-kindergarten, is a foundational skill that children will need when in later grades, formal reading instruction begins. Phonological awareness is the understanding that speech can be broken down into segments or parts, and the ability to manipulate those parts. Phonological awareness is one of the core foundational skills that support the development of early reading abilities, just like roots of a tree. The roots of a tree support it, so it does not fall over. Roots of the tree nourish the tree so it can grow. What would happen if there were no roots on a tree? Children who have good print knowledge skills and also good phonological awareness skills can quickly come to understand the connection between the phonemes or sounds and graphemes, the letters. Understanding this connection will help them benefit more from phonics instruction in kindergarten, first grade, and beyond. Think about the instructional scaffold sounded out. This will only make sense to a child who has a strong foundation in print knowledge, which includes letter names, letter sounds, and concepts of print, phonological awareness, and who has been taught decoding, a process to sound out and read a word. Decoding skills then support the development of reading fluency, and reading fluency is a bridge to reading comprehension. A strong vocabulary and strong oral language skills also contribute to the development of decoding skills, which then supports reading comprehension. The other foundational emergent literacy skills, vocabulary and oral language, directly support reading comprehension. Although all of these emergent literacy skills are important, the focus of this module is on phonological awareness. Without a strong foundation in phonological awareness, a child is unlikely to develop the word reading skills needed to understand text, which is the goal of reading. With a strong foundation in phonological awareness, children can benefit from reading instruction in their future years in school. So we hope that some of your key takeaways are, you know, the strong oral language skills and vocabulary knowledge support reading comprehension and that all of these important emergent literacy components support later um, re when later formal reading instruction begins. So it all begins very early and it's all very important to, to begin this in preschool and earlier. The second area of research and evidence is the PLC format for professional learning. PLCs are probably pretty familiar to you. They come in different uh, formats. For example, some are a book study or a data discussion meeting. 
Typically, a PLC is a team of teachers that meet regularly to learn new topics, share ideas, and problem solve. TLCs have been increasingly used in recent years as a form of professional development. What we've done through the development of these materials is create a structure for collaborative learning. The PLC Emergent Literacy is a structured opportunity designed to follow an evidence-based process. There are several advantages of using the PLC Emergent Literacy developed by the REL Southeast. The instructional practices discussed and practiced are evidence-based, and teachers can embed the instructional practices with any curriculum or program. The PLC Emergent Literacy materials are, are free, <laughs> packaged, they're user-friendly, and they're ready to deliver. So, and there are also embedded supports for facilitators, um, a facilitator guide and, and classroom videos, and a user-friendly participant guide. Finally, the third area of research from which we base the development of these materials is the implementation of evidence-based instructional practices using the features of effective instruction. So every module in the PLC refers to the features of effective instruction, and here's a list of them on the slide. So we talk about instruction being systematic when it's carefully thought out, moves from simple to complex, and is provided in manageable steps. There's a scope and sequence. So there's an overview of what's going to be taught, the content and the order in which it should be taught, the sequence. And then we use the instructional routine to introduce new skills and concepts um, for explicit instruction, the I do, we do, you do instructional routine to make skills and concepts obvious to the child. And then scaffolded instruction is when you provide feedback to help children demonstrate a skill or concept when they couldn't have otherwise done so on their own. And then instructions differentiate. So we're matching your instruction, teacher's instruction to each child's different needs and abilities. So even though we talk about these um, individually, the features of effective instruction, within the PLC, we uh, show models, we talk about and we practice how you can combine these features of effective instruction um, as the basis of high quality literacy instruction for all components of reading. Uh, as shown here, each module includes these evidence-based instructional practices. Examples of these instructional practices are presented in the participant guide, in the self-study reading that the participants do, in videos that they watch. Um, teachers practice these instructional practices during the PLC sessions with their colleagues, as well as after the PLC, or in between the PLC sessions with their children in their classrooms. Um, for this, for today, we're talking about module three, which is vocabulary, and these instructional practices include building and using a network of words, determining which words to teach, dialogic reading, play-based interactions with teacher guidance, and explicit instruction for specific words. We have created a website that I would like to share with you very quickly now that has all of these um, in all of these PLC materials. Okay, can you see that okay? This is the PLC website. Okay, so there are two tabs, professional learning community materials and administrator materials. So I'm just going to very quickly show the PLC community materials. If you click on that tab, you'll see the left hand navigation is organized by module. And there's a brief introduction here. So let's look at module three vocabulary since that's what we're discussing today. So each module is organized in this way. You have the participant guide, which includes, it's a PDF, you can download, you can print, you can look at it online, but it includes everything a teacher needs to participate in a PLC. So it has the overview of the sessions, the five-step process, a session schedule, the self-study readings, and all the activities and materials needed. There's a facilitator guide that includes everything the facilitator needs to guide a team of preschool teachers through this PLC. There are delivery options, how to prepare for each session, a structured plan for each session, and the slides and the speaker notes. The slides are also here to uh, project on a wall during each session. Each video that is aligned with this module is included here. So we have building network of words, and then the key points about each video is right next to it. 
We have dialogic reading, with narrative text, and with expository text. The key points are right next to it, play-based interactions, and then explicit instruction for specific words. So those are the PLC materials. If you click on the administer, administrator materials, we have an overview of webinar one and webinar two, which we've already conducted. And then after today, we'll soon have webinar three and all the materials we're using today. So if you didn't get a chance to be with us for webinar one and two, you can go back and you can see the slides. You can see a video of it. You can also see the reflection guide that we used as a springboard. You can take this back to your site and use it as a springboard for discussion um, about implementing the PLC at your website at your site. So we hope that you take the opportunity to um, look at, at that website and, and use the materials. Okay, our plan for rolling out the PLC included a three-day train the trainer virtual event that we conducted just last month in July. And during this training, up to 10 representatives from each state participated to learn the details of leading the PLC emergent literacy with preschool teachers. We also encouraged those who attended to provide the train the trainer to others in their state who can become facilitators. So all the materials we use for this event will soon be posted on our PLC Emergent Literacy web website that I just showed you. And we'll have a new tab called Facilitator Training on that website. Um, if you're interested in learning who in your state attended this Train the Trainer and may be available to facilitate PLCs at your site and or train others to become facilitators, we encourage you to reach out to your state Department of Education or Child Care Coordinating Agency. Also, as of today, we've conducted three webinars for administrators, and these administrator webinars provide an overview of the materials and support for implementation of the PLC. So our last administrator webinar will be held in November. We hope that you'll join us. It will focus on oral language and stay tuned for that date. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Beth Phillips, who will talk to us about vocabulary. Good morning, everyone. So lovely to see you again. So as um, Dr. Kasanovich just said, I'll be providing an overview of module three vocabulary. We don't have the time for me to present you, you know, every piece of it, but we're gonna hit some of the highlights and um, give you a, a teaser and a taste of what is included in this particular module. So one thing I really wanna emphasize right from the beginning here is that even though we made the organizational decision to separate vocabulary from the rest of oral language in these modules, it's very important to recognize that vocabulary is, of course, a part of oral language. And so really, um, if we could go back and rename the modules, we would have said vocabulary and then module for module three, and then module four would be the rest of oral language as opposed to just oral language, because we certainly do not want to convey at all the message that vocabulary is somehow distinct from oral language. We also, however, wanted to make sure that the message got sent that oral language was not only vocabulary. And so if you join us in November for module four, if you look on the website at the module four materials, you'll see how there is so much more to oral language than just vocabulary. That being said, we are gonna focus today on this component of oral language, um, which is important, vocabulary. So what is vocabulary? Well, vocabulary knowledge is, of course, a key element of oral language, as I just said. It's necessary for communication. And of course, as I'm sure you know, from birth, the child's brain is open to learning language. So vocabulary begins to develop long, long before children begin preschool programs or even reach their first birthday. The size of a child's vocabulary is strongly related to how much parents and caregivers talk with the child. So quantity, how much and how often, quality in terms of diversity and complexity, and responsiveness of both parents and teachers can support children's vocabulary growth. We use words to think. So the more words a child knows, the better able he or she is to communicate about their own experiences and to describe and relate experiences about the world. 
Of course, the other reason we care about vocabulary is that vocabulary is an important predictor and contributor to reading comprehension, just like you saw in the literacy, literacy tree video. Reading comprehension essentially has two primary predictors. The simple view of reading, which sums up this model, states that reading comprehension is equivalent to the product of decoding, the capacity to recognize the words in print, and language comprehension, the capacity to translate those printed words into something meaningful. Language comprehension includes all the language skills that enable us to understand the words we read and also to write words that can communicate to others. Vocabulary knowledge is necessary to understand oral language that we read or that is read to us because we need to know what the words mean in order to understand a speaker's message. This applies to listening to books read aloud as well as engaging in everyday conversations. Vocabulary also directly supports decoding once children begin formal reading instruction in later grades. When older children are reading and come to an unfamiliar word, they will try to use words they've already heard to make sense of the unfamiliar word. If the word is already in their oral language, meaning that they've heard it and ideally even used it before, they can much more easily decode and understand the word. Vocabulary is, of course, also directly related to reading comprehension because understanding text requires knowledge of the meanings of the words and the sentences that we are reading. Vocabulary instruction occurs in meaningful contexts with many, many, many opportunities for active engagement, rich conversations, and intentional instruction. Children are more likely to learn to remember words that are connected to one another and taught within a meaningful topic or theme. So the example theme we're showing you today is nutrition. So we can consider knowledge of words as being synonymous with what we call lexical knowledge. Lexical knowledge is organized in networks of words and their meanings. So the way we think about the meanings of words can be visualized as a web. This web connects the words that we have in our lexical knowledge. So imagine a word towards the center of the web with connections running out to other words to create a web. This is referred to as a network or web of words. So the example on the slide shows a network of words beginning with the center word nutrition. So why are we talking about networks of words? Well, it's important to recognize that understanding how we organize words in our brain can be translated into a very helpful way of organizing instruction of vocabulary. So a network of words is a very helpful planning tool as a teacher begins a new thematic unit. The network can help the teacher determine what words to teach. A network can also be built with the children visually to help teach new words that, and teach about the connections of the words that are being newly taught to words that are already in children's lexical knowledge bank. When building networks with children, a teacher would use visuals, including pictures and sketches and even gestures, as the, so the focus remains on connections among the words and not on reading the words. So this is not about teaching the children decoding, this is about teaching children semantic knowledge, lexical knowledge. These are all synonyms for knowing the meaning of words. So let's continue to look at the same network of words about nutrition as we make more connections and build out the network. So nutrition is at the center of this web, and it began with just three links to the words prepare, healthy, and food groups. From there, many of the words have connections to one another, like prepare and serve, as well as prepare and blend, creating a big interconnected web of words. Okay, so we're going to show this animation one more time. Notice each new layer of the network is a different color as it continues to grow, and more connections were made. <clears throat> so I hope that you can notice in this network the idea that there's lots of different 
parts of speech and words that relate to nutrition as the central thematic element in many different ways. Now, of course, we stopped this network so it wouldn't overspill the screen, but we could, of course, keep building and growing this network almost infinitely. So how do we use this idea of building and developing networks of words in the course of planning vocabulary instruction? So preschool teachers often teach around thematic units or themes, such as insects, nutrition, or transportation. When chosen carefully, these themes can provide children with meaningful opportunities to learn about the world around them and the concepts and the words we use to describe the world. So here is an organized four-step process for teachers to strategically plan to teach vocabulary knowledge. The first thing is you'd select the theme you want to teach. So in this case, our example theme, once again, is nutrition. Once the theme is selected, determine the concepts that you want to teach. What do you want the children to know about nutrition by the time the unit is over? Concepts are the building blocks of ideas. For example, if your theme is nutrition, you may want children to learn concepts such as food groups, healthy eating, where food comes from, and food preparation. Each concept has its own network of words that represent the ideas and the descriptions associated with the concepts. Once you have your theme, your concepts, and your network of words, then you select books and activities to support learning the network of words. So this works from the bottom up, theme to concept to word to materials. Once you have all these things in place, you can plan meaningful and engaging activities and share books that will support children in building their vocabulary knowledge and prepare them for reading comprehension later. So one way you can build vocabulary knowledge inside this theme link and network linked model is through a process or instructional strategy that we call dialogic theme. So a focus of dialogic reading is to help children learn new words by creating a dialogue about vocabulary illustrated in the book. Reading the same book over and over again with, with a small group of children, children learn to communicate their thoughts and ideas using the new words they're learning in increasingly complex phrases and sentences. Dialogic reading is an evidence-based, well supported means of helping children increase the size of their vocabulary, the diversity of their knowledge about the world, and their broader oral language skills, such as their ability to communicate in longer and more and more complex sentences. So the version of dialogic reading that we are emphasizing today, which is the evidence-based version, involves five section, sessions that typically span five days. So this graphic that you can see on the screen is a summary of the five sessions for dialogic reading. So let's start at the bottom of the graphic. During session one of dialogic reading, the teacher introduces the book by telling children concepts of print related to books, such as the title, author, and illustrator. Also in session one, the teacher reads the entire book all the way through with the goal of children being introduced to the story and understanding the story. Sessions two and three, Share of dialogic reading share the same goal and format. Now the focus is no longer on reading the book from end to end, but rather on helping children learn the vocabulary of the book by labeling the objects and actions in the illustrations. So now instead of the text of the story taking center stage, it's the illustrations that take center stage. Children need to know the vocabulary of the book to be successful during the later dialogic reading sessions, numbers four and five. During session four, the teacher continues to ask these labeling questions while adding open-ended questions, like, what do you see on the page? Open-ended questions encourage many different responses and provide children opportunities to continue practicing their language skills. Open-ended questions can't be answered with a single word or yes or no, so it requires children to use their and practice their expressive language skills. After children answer open-ended questions, teachers respond with repetitions, affirmations, expansions, or multi-word statements. 
using these strategies with the children models more sophisticated language and vocabulary use for the children. By session five of dialogic reading, children should have a very firm grasp of the key vocabulary in, this, in the book. The teacher now asks questions related to plot, knowledge of the concepts depicted in the book, and connecting the book to children's personal experiences. So the graphic on the slide illustrates the idea of layering more knowledge and varying the type of questions asked across the five sessions of dialogic reading. Notice how each arrow begins in a new session, but continues through the rest of the sessions. Each new type of prompt gets added to the previously introduced prompts. The new prompts are prioritized, but other prompts remain. Okay, so here is an example of an illustration that would be good to use for building vocabulary through dialogic reading that aligns with our nutrition theme. This image is in the facilitator and participants guides of module three PLC. So I'm gonna model some questions that might be asked during sessions two and three in dialogic reading, and you can type your answers in the chat. You ready? Okay. So if I wanted to ask questions to elicit nouns, verbs, and adjectives, I might start by saying, pointing to the picnic basket and saying, what is this? And you would answer. So you might answer at the picnic basket. Let's say you already knew what that word is, but I wouldn't just stop there then. I would say, yes, it's a picnic basket. What do we use a picnic basket for? And then I might, right, to carry food, exactly. So I would make sure that they don't just know the image and the label, but know the function and the purpose of the various objects. So then I might try to elicit a, a verb by pointing to the girl with the hamburger and saying, what's she doing with the hamburger? What might you say? She's eating it, she's holding it. That's exactly right. And if what I might do then is model a, a more sophisticated word for eat, because of course the children are likely to know eat, but maybe they don't know chew or devour or consume. And so you might vary what synonyms you might want to teach depending on the level of age and sophistication and vocabulary knowledge of your children. So you can of course differentiate this with different groups of children. So now I might point to the watermelon and ask the child to describe it. This is eliciting adjectives such as, well, what? What adjectives can you think of to describe the watermelon? Juicy, exactly. Juicy, delicious, red, sweet, exactly. By asking children to describe a noun as opposed to just labeling a noun, you're eliciting the use of adjectives. And so after we ask these initial questions, you would follow it up with things like, what do we use it for? What shape is it? What color it is? Where would you see it? What else might you see when you see that? So what are some other questions that we could ask about this picture? Type a question in the chat followed by a possible answer, and you can also answer one another's questions. So take a minute now and type some ideas about the whole picture or any element of the picture into the chat. Great, what is the, where's the family having their picnic? Excellent, what is the man on the bench doing? Right, reading the newspaper. Notice the squirrel, describe what the squirrel is doing. That's exactly, so you see how you can get not just nouns, but also adjectives and verbs. What time of day do you think it is? Where's the squirrel going? What's the setting? What's the mom doing? Why are her hands up? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that one, but the kids can make up anything they wanted to about that one. What is the family sitting on? Good, so you, it's not like you should avoid nouns because maybe they don't know the, the words for a beach blanket or a picnic blanket. What time of day do you think it is? 
what's the weather like? Right. How do you know? So you, you can get them to describe the blue sky and the fact that it looks kind of sunny. And you can point to the fact that there are shadows under the bicycle and the woman running. So that helps you know that it's sunny out. Exactly. These are these are great questions. So you can see you could spend a long time on a single image just exploring all of its different components together with the children. Okay, so here's an example of what dialogic reading looks like in the classroom using the same nutrition. This teacher chose an expository or nonfiction text that includes concepts and words from the network of words that she created when pl planning vocabulary lessons focused on nutrition. These expository or nonfiction books can be really engaging for children. So let's watch a part of a video from the PLC. We've abbreviated this video, but you'll get sort of a sense of it. This video is called Dialogic Reading with Expository Text. It includes snippets from days one to five of dialogic reading. So as you watch the video, think about the different kinds of questions the teacher is asking. This video is gonna last about six minutes. So I want you to, while you're watching, think about the focus during days one, two, three, and four and how you see things evolving over the course of the multiple days. Okay. This book is called Good Enough to Eat, A Kid's Guide to Food and Nutrition. That's an interesting word, right? Nutrition? Like, yeah, what do you think about that, huh? I don't know what that means. Well, we are going to learn, exactly. So this book is written by Lizzie Rockwell. She is the author, because the author does what? Write the words. Writes the words, the author writes words. But you want to know something else that's really cool about this book? Lizzie Rockwell, she's also the illustrator. So that means she also drew the pictures in the book, too. So she not only wrote the book, but she drew the pictures. So she did both jobs. That is cool. That is cool, yeah. Good Enough to Eat, A Kid's Guide to Food and Nutrition by Lizzie Rockwell. Remember earlier when we read our book, Good Enough to Eat, A Kid's Guide to Food and Nutrition? Mm -hmm. And we learned some things about different food groups and nutrients. Well, we are going to learn some new words. We're going to go back, but this time we're not going to read our book. We're going to go through, skip around, and we're going to look at some fun pages, and we're going to learn some new words, okay? Look at this picture. What's this baby doing? Crying. crying. Why is the baby crying? He's because he wants food. He's hungry. Everyone said it. Bryson said because he's hungry. That's baby that food. that is the baby food. And Sarah said, why what, what did you say? He he wants food. He wants some food. And remember when we read earlier that sometimes when you get hungry, like the baby, you may cry or like older people, your stomach may grumble. So oh, okay. Berlin, look at this picture right here. So these things that are sitting in the spaghetti bowl. Let's see, Berlin, do you know what this is called? I can see. I'll move it around so you can see. Hmm? Noodles. Noodles, so the, there are noodles in the bowl, that's right. But look at this metal thing right here. What is that called? Sorry if I wasn't pointing to that. Do you know what that's called? Do you not know? I do. What do you think? It's called a pincher. A pincher. It does pinch food. And this is actually called tongs. So it picks up food. It helps us serve food. Um, it, it has some spiky it things. It does. It, it, can. it can. So these are tongs. Everyone says, say tongs. 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 With a T. Say tongs. No, Let me hear tongs. you say it. Tongs. 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 These are tongs. And tongs. We, yeah, it sounds like tongs. Tongs. And we use tongs to pick up food and serve it to boys and girls. Hello. 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 So do you remember yesterday we were reading our book? About healthy food. About healthy food, all about nutrition. So it was good enough to eat. Bryson, can you tell me what the family is doing right now? What are they doing? They're eating. They're eating, They're eating lots of tasty meatballs. Yeah, meatballs. The spaghetti. <laughs> spaghetti. Salad. Salad. What do you see Carrots? them eating? Carrots. What else do you see them eating, Sarah? Uh, Bread. bread so they're eating all types of food and this food all looks really good doesn't it looks yeah. really tasty oh, oh, oh. 
And what's a really fancy word that means tasty? Or another yes. word that means yummy. 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 Yummy is a good word. Yes. But what about yeah. delicious? This food looks delicious. Okay. Okay. Hold on. Can you all say delicious? Delicious. Delicious. Delicious is just another fancy word or a way we can say taste. Oh. We are going to revisit our book again good enough to eat but this time i want you all to do the talking so you guys get to pick out fun things that you see on the page and i want you to tell me everything about them okay does that sound good carrots carrots what about those carrots why are those carrots healthy for you well carrot juice mm -hmm. because they make your body strong and they make you can pick up big things and the and the what and and mommy will be so proud of you. Sarah said something where that's really good. She said they make your bones strong and they help you pick up big things. And when food does that, when we're able to move about because we eat food, it's because food gives us what? Energy. 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 Food gives us energy. That's a new Let's look at all the different fruits and vegetables. And I see broccoli. Oh, broccoli. Is that, so tell me some of the vegetables or fruits that you would buy if you were at the I store. Buy, I, I would buy, I would buy carrots. You would buy carrots. I, I'll buy the big carrots. Which one are the big carrots? Where are the big carrots? Right there, you'd buy the big carrots. <laughs> what would you purchase would if buy, you were at the store, Eli? Um, 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 I, would, I would buy garlic. Um, eggplants, um, strawberries, pears, bananas, and watermelon. So you buy a bunch. And, and I would buy broccoli and oranges. And oranges? What would and, you and buy? I would and, buy and watermelon. And watermelon. And Those all sound good. Buy Sarah, show me. Point. And tell, show who's preparing something in this picture. Bison, this girl, tell me what this girl is preparing. She's, she's she, doing she, the cup. She. She's, she's making the cup she, for she everyone. She's 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 she squeezed some some lemon Women. lemon juice into the drink so it can no, be lemonade. Not. So she is preparing. No, she's not. She, she's preparing glasses no, for drinks for everyone. No, Berlin. She's putting lemons on the side. Yeah, she's putting lemons on the side. And she's preparing drinks for everyone. And she, um, and that's pretzels. Um, what is she doing um, with those pretzels? Pretzel. Putting them um, in the oven. She's preparing pretzel, pretzels by um, putting them, taking them um, out of the oven. All right, boys and girls, good job with our book this week of Good Enough to Eat. We all talked about nutrition, yeah, food groups, healthy, healthy eating. I, So again, that is just a um, a segment of a longer video that is embedded inside the PLC that shows you um, the systematic way that questions are added and layered and the dialogue that can ensue by exploring a book together with a small group of children repeatedly. So um, let's talk about what happened on the very first day. What are some of the things that happened on day one of dialogic reading? You can unmute yourself or you can type into the chat. Right, so the teacher read the book from start to finish. This is the only time during the five sessions that she's gonna read the whole book. Although of course in later sessions, she might read sections here and there. And she introduced the concepts of print, the title of the book, the author and the illustrator. And she gave an overview of the topic and why they were reading the book. So she connected the book to the larger conceptual idea and the thematic unit of nutrition. Excellent. So what about on days two and three? What were some of the questions in the focus during those two days? Labeling, that's right. So she's trying to 
Yeah, that's right. She's naming things and she's teaching synonyms. So remember when we're teaching children new words, sometimes they already know one label for the word and the job is to teach them a more advanced synonym. But other times the job is to introduce the entire concept. So children, some of those children may have never have seen a tongs before. And so she relied on the illustration and the function and the description and the whole conversation about the tongs, for example, to introduce what may have been an entirely new conceptual idea to those to some of those children. She's asking, right, she's asking follow-up questions, exactly. So what's it used for? What color is it? And so on. And yes, yeah, she's connecting learning to what they already know. But she's not necessarily expanding out yet to their own experiences. She's still staying relatively narrow within the focus of the book. This is because we really want to make sure that she's teaching the vocabulary of the book and teaching those conceptual ideas before she's asking them necessarily to relate the, those new ideas to their own experiences. So it's important dialogic reading not to necessarily get ahead of yourself and race to those real life connections before you've done sufficient um, effort on teaching the language of the book. Okay, so what about during day four? Right, so during day four, she switched to asking fewer labeling questions, although she still did some of those, and some more open-ended questions. What do you see here? What do you want to tell us about this page? What else do you see in this picture? Those are the kind of open-ended questions that allow the children to follow their own interests and talk about whatever they want to talk about about the, about the pictures. And if days one, two, and three have built their vocabulary, what you will hear them doing in days four and beyond is using some of the brand new vocabulary in their open-ended question responses. And then of course you can model that and you can keep following up with um, questions to derive more and more language from the children. And then finally, during day five, what was the teacher's focus? Right, so she's always going back and modeling the new vocabulary as needed. And so now in day five, you're doing those personal connections exactly, Mary. So you're bringing the vocabulary to what they know. It was more application, right? So it's now connecting beyond the pages of the book, so to speak, as she asked them, for example, to talk about what they would buy themselves. And you can see there was a whole long list of vocabulary words that some of those children may not have been using at the beginning of that week because she took the time to sort of methodically build up their capacity to talk that much about this concept. And you can see from their answers as she was wrapping up that they really did learn a whole lot of words. And they, more importantly, even they learned a lot of concepts about healthy eating and what we mean by nutrition. So what are some other things that you noticed across the week about the questions the teachers asked? She kept repeating the goals she wanted them to know on the final day, exactly. So she was cumulatively reviewing what they've learned. And yes, the questions became more open-ended across time. Yes, the questions required thinking. So even on day one and two and three, when she was doing more straightforward labeling questions, they still required thinking because of the follow-up questions, the, especially the function and um, in description follow-up questions. So there's thinking all throughout. And yes, the students use the words from the book even more, and she really reinforced that. Excellent, thank you so much. Okay, so switching away from dialogic reading, there's another effective way to export learning vocabulary from the network of words that has nothing to do with books. And so our important message to you here is that while books are an amazing source of vocabulary, they are absolutely not the only way the children can learn new words. You don't always have to have a book in hand in order to teach new words. So one of the ways you can do this is what we call play-based interactions with teacher's guidance. So this is a primarily child-directed 
activity, but include teacher initiated engagement where the teacher isn't taking over the activity, but is embedding herself in the activity to try to steer the conversation essentially in ways that shapes and guides children's vocabulary through the models, questions, materials that are introduced and comments during their play. So how adults act and what adults say as you're learning are critical to children's learning. To implement play-based interactions with teacher guidance, teachers first determine specific words for the network to target. Then teachers enhance the classroom environment with props or activities to trigger the target word. In other words, you want to embed opportunities for these words to be authentically used in the activities going on during play. And then finally, while playing, the teachers will use interactions and casual conversations casual but intentional conversations to support children's learning by embedding opportunities to learn new words and ideas. So here are examples of activities prepared for centers during the nutrition theme. So the target words that this teacher wants to focus on are delicious, dairy, and blend. So adjective, verbs. At the art center, the teacher may cut apples and pears in half, have the children dip the fruit in paint and press on paper. I'm sure you've seen this kind of activity before. But the teacher is going to build on this opportunity by initiating multi-turn conversations and supports peer-to-peer -peer interaction by saying things like, hmm, I'm going to try to blend together the red paint on the apple with the blue paint I put on my pear. What do you think will happen? When I blend the red and the blue paint, watch what happens. I get purple. What happens when you blend red and blue? Hmm, this apple has paint all over it. Apples are delicious, but is this specific apple gonna be delicious? Well, I want to be. I'm in the hopes of eliciting something like, well, you got paint all over it. It's not gonna be delicious or yummy anymore. At the block center, children build a place for cows on a dairy farm. At the kitchen center, the children grocery shop for food to make a smoothie so they can talk about blending all the ingredients into a smoothie and they can talk about blending in something like a blender or a food processor so in art they talk about blending and delicious in the block area they talked about the dairy farm and the delicious milk that comes from cows and in the kitchen you bring all three of these words together blend and dairy and delicious to make a dairy and fruit based smoothie. So you can see it's really not that complicated to embed lots and lots of new target vocabulary words into children's daily play. But you have to be thoughtful and intentional about it. You have to plan ahead. And then of course, you can also seize the spontaneous moments that come up, but it builds from the foundation of prior planning. Okay, so during dialogic reading and these play based interactions, a variety of conversational strategies should be used by teachers to help get the most out of the opportunities. So of course, it begins with asking questions that invite extended responses. So even though you may start with some labeling questions, you're always gonna follow up with more open-ended questions and invite the children to say more than just a couple of words. So you may ask questions about the children's knowledge of vocabulary. For example, if the child is pretending to cook at the kitchen center, you would say, what are you preparing to eat? as opposed to maybe just making to eat. When a child responds with green beans, you might say, what else is in your meal? So this topic extending prompt models the more sophisticated word meal, but it also helps the child extend their own response. So they may have just given you one answer, green beans, but now you're inviting them to say about more, what more, what else is in your meal? You provide meaningful feedback to children's comments by asking more questions defining words using child-friendly definitions, and of course, making explicit connections between words and between children's background knowledge and the new information. So you introduce new vocabulary by labeling things that are being actively used in the moment. For example, you could say, what are you using to stir the vegetable soup you're making? A child responds, spoon. Yes, that's a special kind of spoon called a ladle. See, the end of the ladle is shaped like a bowl, a ladle is used just like you're using it to stir and serve soup. And now the child is going to be prompted most likely to use the word ladle to up her game essentially from spoon to ladle during her play. 
of course, it's always remember, let's always remember that it's important to use wait time effectively. So I was just using wait time with you all when I asked you to type some things into the prompt, into the chat box. And using wait time with young children is particularly important. It takes them a little bit of time to think about what they want to say. So it's important not to barrel through that wait time. And so we recommend that you count to five, 10, something like that in your head. Count Mississippis, count hippopotami, whatever it helps you to do to, um, to pause, take a breath and give them time to think. This wait time lets children know that what they say is worth waiting for, that it's important. Okay. So before we move into our breakout rooms, I want to pause and see if you have some specific questions or comments about what we've discussed so far. You can unmute yourself and talk, or as always, you can type into the chat. I was just thinking that this is really so powerful because it we talk about vocabulary. We see all the time in data that it's you know, always a problem spot for us. But I don't think we truly prepare teachers for what do you do to teach vocabulary? And this is so nice to see the steps because I think we kind of get in a rut. We do the same thing and it's not really working, but it's all we know to do. So I just think this is a really good framework for teachers to live in to help build that vocabulary. And it's obviously building a lot of oral vocabulary, which we know our younger children are often lacking. So this is a very nice framework that I can't wait to share with teachers. Well, Becky, we're so glad to hear you say that. Yes, um, the, the whole idea was to give structure to teachers' desire to do more, which is sort of what you just articulated. People know that they're probably underutilizing their opportunities, but it's not always easy to figure out, well, what, what exactly else should I be doing? And so um, what you'll see when you explore the module is that I've just barely skimmed the surface of all the many, many, many different ideas that we've embedded in this module for lots of different ways across the whole day with and without books, with and without props that teachers can introduce and explore vocabulary with children in a, in a thorough, thoughtful and systematic way. Other comments and questions that you want to share? Right, so Jessica's commenting in the chat that the steps for dialogic reading um, and that the teacher provides the focus for each step each day, right? Um, it's never a bad idea to tell children what you're hoping they'll get out of an activity. And so the dialogic reading steps helps formalize and organize that for teachers and children. In fact, part of those effective instructional strategies that Marcia was referencing before include the idea of just saying what the goal is, right? Sometimes we hide the goals from children as if they, they shouldn't know them, but really telling them straight out what you're trying to help them learn is a great way to help them move towards that goal. Other comments or questions about what we've shared so far? Yeah, so Ruth is emphasizing something that we took very great care to make sure we really emphasize. And trust me when I tell you this is all over the module, the idea that there's more to learn than just nouns. There's all this whole world of other parts of speech. So we make sure that we provided you lots and lots of strategies and lots and lots of examples of teaching, not just nouns, but adjectives, verbs, and adverbs. Um, all the way through the module. Right, because you know you need more than nouns in order to actually speak in connected sentences, right? You can't just go from noun to noun to noun. You need the, the muscles around the bones of the nouns in order to build out meaningful communication and to understand it when other people are sharing it with you. Other questions, comments, and thoughts? Okay, so um, here's the game plan. So in a minute, we're gonna be heading to four breakout rooms so we can have deeper discussions and learn from one another. There'll be a facilitator in each room, myself, Carly, Sarah, or Marcia. And we've also enlisted a 
enlisted a colleague for each breakout room who will help us take notes and share highlights from our discussions once we come back to the main room. Okay, so Nathan is gonna send us now to breakout rooms. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Marcia. <laughs> I was welcoming everybody on mute. <laughs> so um, I'm Sarah Hughes. So we just really wanted to do some quick highlights um, from each of the breakout um, discussions today. Just take a moment to kind of, for each room to um, kind of say what sort of a, a key um, takeaway was from their discussion. Um, so we'll start actually with my room. So if uh, Lori, if you don't mind chiming in. I'm glad to share. Uh, we had a great conversation in our breakout room. Uh, we focused first of all on that vocabulary instruction in your context. And uh, Robin from Mississippi shared that they use a uh, curriculum there in Mississippi that is very heavily um, vocabulary, uh, deals with vocabulary a great deal. And so she was happy about that. And then Melissa from Florida shared uh, that uh, there are standards in Florida and, and probably your other states have these as well. Uh, and in Florida, those standards uh, roll right into K-12. So they, the early learning standards are aligned with K-12. And so again, there is uh, an emphasis on vocabulary instruction and what that might look like in the uh, pre-K level. And then uh, Mary brought up, I think, a really great point regarding dialogic reading. And uh, she discovered dialogic reading here in the last year or so and felt that it's been really powerful, especially in building oral language in uh, young students in a developmentally appropriate kind of way. And so um, she was really happy to, to share that thought with us. And um, so we spent a good deal of time talking about vocabulary instruction and what it might look like in the context of a pre-K classroom. That's great. And I'll just round out our discussion. We also kind of reminded each other that this, the PLC is really valuable for teacher assistants, volunteers, if they're, you know, working in the classroom and also kindergarten teachers. We, we kind of talked about some value there when we got into the developmentally appropriate um, discussion. And absolutely. And just one yeah. more point that was really emphasized in our group, and that was intentionality, being yeah. intentional and purposeful. And um, that's so important um, when we're teaching vocabulary and using dialogic reading. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Lori. All right, let's switch over to um, Beth's group. Um, I will share out for Beth's Take group. Care. Um, yeah, so we talked a lot about the small group instruction section, so I want to highlight um, specifically some things we discussed about the role of administrators in terms of uh, facilitating uh, small group instruction. Uh, the first being um, that administrators um, having a better understanding about the value and importance of small group instruction is really important to see that translated then into um, uh, the small group instruction actually occurring in classrooms, um, providing time for PLCs um, for teachers, as well as the assistants, um, like you all mentioned, um, getting classroom coverage so that teachers have an opportunity to um, observe other classrooms in the same center um, that may be um, really strong with, with the vocabulary instruction in those small groups. And then um, having morning meetings with teachers and assistants, just to make sure that everyone is prepared for the day and on the same page with um, the goals for that day. That's great. Thanks, Sarah. And Marcia's group, is there anything to add? Any? Yep, I'll share out for Marcia's group. So um, I'm gonna try not to repeat anything that's already been mentioned. So two things I wanted to highlight from our group. Um, one was that we talked about uh, when teachers are using small groups, sometimes it's hard to, um, for the kids who might want to be doing other things kids in the class are doing um, rather than being in a small group. And so we talked about um, at certain centers where um, they're encouraging the teachers or teachers are on their own, um, pushing into centers students are already working at and learning how to develop vocabulary um, by joining students at a center rather than per se pulling them from a center. Um, so making um, good use of the students' choices that the students have. And, and that also comes with intentionally planning centers so that you're putting students in situations where 
um, there are things that you and the as a teacher can step in and, and discuss um, given whatever the students are playing with or, or doing. Um, and then the other thing is um, getting teachers to or supporting teachers in using formative assessments so they can uh, really have an understanding of where their students are at to help plan small group um, instruction and opportunities in the classroom that is tailored to meet their students' needs. That's great. And Carly's group. Hi, this is Kevin. I'll share with Carly's group. She did a great job leading and we had phenomenal participation and discussion. So I'll, I'll round out by talking about vocabulary to just bring a couple of things in that you and Lori discussed. Um, one, there's a lot of turnover in, in educator workforce for early learning right now. That's an issue that we heard from several participants, but all throughout our conversation. So they really like the fact that this is very explicit strategies for vocabulary instruction. And it would help with the videos and the really clear, explicit oh, wow. directions. It would help with vocabulary instruction, especially the new teachers they have coming in. Um, then um, a lot of them really try to come back from trainings like this and align it with what their state requirements are and uh, really try to tweak it if needed. Um, don't underestimate the students. Give them time to talk. Give them time to use the vocabulary. Um, and using interactive word walls and other strategies aligned with this, they thought was very beneficial for vocabulary instruction. So great job for our group. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. So I'm just going to, you know, very quickly set, give everyone a kind of a reminder about um, the PLC Emergent Literacy website, which I just actually posted the link to the website. Please make sure that you pull that up right now and um, put a bookmark on it. You'll see that there are currently two tabs on there. One is with the materials themselves. Marcia kind of went through that. And then the other tab is the administrator materials, including the reflection guide. So visit the site, explore the materials, explore the PLC concept um, at, with your, your colleagues and with leadership wherever you work. Um, and take a look at the reflection guide to check your own readiness for that. So the next thing that we'll be doing is webinar four, which is going to be in November. So watch for uh, more information that's coming about that. The focus will be on module four, which is oral language. Um, yep, we can just skip right over. We already kind of covered it. And then the last thing before you go, we have just posted, Carly just posted the stakeholder, uh, a feedback survey. This is extremely helpful. Um, to us as we begin to plan. We, we look at the feedback that we receive from this survey every time that we do the next module. So for module four, it's really helpful if we have your feedback so that we can keep improving it. We really appreciate your time and participation in today's webinar. We encourage you to open up that survey link right now. We've had excellent response rates and we wanna make sure that we continue to have excellent response rates. So please help us out with that. Um, if you open it up, then it's on your screen. You're more likely to fill it out. It's actually pretty short, so it shouldn't be too bad. <laughs> um, we're striving to enhance um, support that to, to provide um, you with the information that you need. Um, and finally, if you have any um, other questions or concerns, post them in the chat. We really do look at that chat very carefully. We'll hang out for just a minute. So if you wanna kind of like hang for a minute just to type your last minute chat question, um, we will review those and take a look and make sure that we get responses out to you some way. So thank you so much. Um, it was Excuse me, Sarah, can sure. you put the link back up for the survey? For the survey? Yes. Yep, it's right in the chat. Okay. Can you open up your chat? Okay, let me see. If you, okay, um, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I see you. Right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for asking for it. That never happens. <laughs> so, I like to fill out surveys. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you again. Um, we look forward to seeing you in November. Um, have a great rest of the week.